Before I start, please do me a favor and like this video or just leave a comment. And if you know what I usually ask, please do that as well in the comments. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see. Well, let's look at this one here. What is, what is this? Booking.com. It says, when I log into booking.office.com, my screen starts flashing and switching between screens. Below is the screenshot. Well, actually, more than a screenshot. This is a quick video, actually. Let's look at this here. It's the same thing as logging into office, outlookoffice.com and then going to the bookings page. It just like... Oh. It's so. the same thing as logging into office, outlookoffice.com and then going to the bookings page. It just like... You see, it's you the same thing said? as... So, the same thing happens whenever they go to office.com or when they go to bookings.office.com. So, what's going on here is that you have two different businesses using same type of cloud service for their email or for possibly everything else. And this is indicated by ending here where it says office.com. In this case, bookings.office.com is using Microsoft cloud-based service for their business. Chances are the business that you work for here is also using office.com for their services. Now, it may not be called office.com, but they're using their same cloud service for the login, for the authentication. So that's what it's happening here. And I don't know if you noticed when I played the video, you've mentioned the same thing happens at office.com. So why is that happening? Well, here, let me just go to office.com right now, office.com. You see how automatically logged me in because I'm logged in with Microsoft domain based cloud login for Microsoft 365. And this can happen even in the businesses that have been around for a while because everybody's moving towards cloud based computing, cloud based computing. So even if you work for a business and they use regular Active Directory login for their domain, Chances are they are moving towards cloud. Matter of fact, they have no choice at this point. And then everything that is web-based can be web-based. And for those reasons, when you go to office.com, you see how I'm here, office.com, just like you go to office.com, I can also log in. When I hover over this login ID here, again, this is not a real person. It says here, Bob at CosmicNovo.onMicrosoft.com. This could be anything. This could be called my business, blah, 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 blah. So it could be some big companies also at destination, right? So let's say you work for, I don't know, Google.com. Well, not they wouldn't use it. They would use Google Docs. <laughs> but let's say they use what's some big company. I don't know. Let's say AT&T or Verizon, T-Mobile, something like that. This could say tmobile.com, but it would be your work login ID. Chances are it would still be serviced or pro the service would be provided through the cloud services of Microsoft, which was which would be office.com. So you have to go in and sign out of this, sign out of the this account, make sure you sign out of this account and then go to bookings.office.com. Matter of fact, let's see if I get the same issue. It may not be because sometimes it's, it's just a corrupted, uh, the way it's just confused, but let's see, booking.office.com. You see how it tries to use my own credentials that I just showed you, not my own. Again, this is a fake person, but you see how it's trying to use that. Well, it's trying to automatically use that in your case. So you have to make sure that you log out of that first or even go into the credentials manager and delete that if you want to be able to access that. But normally you should have the option to do another one. <laughs> Let's do this here. Let's go back to it. You should be able to use another account right here. You know, but you're not getting that because it's automatically trying to log in with your currently logged in ID. I hope that's explainable. I hope that's uh, un understood, I shouldn't say ex explainable. It is explainable because I just explained that, but I hope it's understood. I'm going to say, I think what is going on is that booking dot 
Is it booking or bookings? Bookings. Dot office dot com is trying to use your regular office dot com account credentials. I would log out of office dot com and try again terrible at spelling but English is my second language so hopefully it's forgiven <laughs> that takes care of that all right let's work on something else uh, here let's try this one here this is just a random one I guess can I use X copy on CMD to access and transfer data on a BitLocker drive Computer is not booting on recovery boot cycle. If I remove the hard drive and connect it to another PC as external drive, can I use X copy on CMD to access transfer data? If yes, please. Okay. So you would need the the unlock. You would need the BitLocker key to do this. So what's happening is that let's say you do attach that drive. So here is my computer. Let's say that's this drive here. If it's locked, well, if it's still working, right? If it's still working, it would show up. And I'm assuming it's not damaged to a point where you can't use it. You would have a lock key. So you can move you can move hard drives from one computer to another, and you can immediately open them up, even boot to the operating system on that same drive. However, you're gonna need the bit locker key. Now if you put this hard drive into a different computer, it's going to ask for the BitLocker key. It will, it will not boot. And if you have the BitLocker key, you can type it in and it's going to work. But if you add it as a shared drive like this, you know, as a second drive, that's fine. You can do that, but it will have a lock on here. And I have a video on this too as well somewhere else. And But anyways, it's really simple. You have to right click and then unlock it you would have that option in here to unlock it but you would have to use that key for that drive so if you don't have that drive you're out of luck so i'm going to say yes but you need the bit locker key to unlock the drive first yeah I have a real demonstration of this there's a video somewhere uh, I don't know just go to youtube.com forward slash cobble man and there's a search box somewhere and just type in bitlocker and uh, that should do it if you want a bit more detail with the demonstration oh here's a MacBook one sure let's do MacBook uh, tech support does support Max, but not too much, but it does happen occasionally, so it's good to know some stuff. It says, my calendar on MacBook is not syncing with my Outlook calendar. The calendar is syncing fine on my iPad and iPhone, but not my MacBook. You know, this happens a lot. You have people using Apple products, but they, you know, they want to use business stuff that is office-based, which is Microsoft.com stuff, right? Microsoft stuff. It says... I have deleted my account and re-added it, but still not syncing. Now I can't get mail on my MacBook either. So, I mean, I know you're saying here my calendar on MacBook is not syncing with my Outlook calendar. And you've re-added your account. And that's fine. I would certainly do that as well just to make sure. But if you've tried everything else and you tried it online and it works online, you know, office.com or outlook.com. And if that's working fine, if the web version is working fine, but your app is not working, then the issue is with your app. So that app needs to be updated, reinstalled, or something like that. I would concentrate on that and go from there. So I'm going to say, I would reinstall the Outlook app on the MacBook. All right.
All right, what is this one here? New camera slowing down computers. We recently got the new camera system. It seems that an occasion logging in, logging into the cameras on our workstation is slowing down or freezing other functions on the computer like email and etc. It is prom problematic because we need the cameras up to watch students in our testing centers, but we also need to do other tasks. Do you have any other, do you have any tips that might help us alleviate this issue? So when it comes to viewing cameras, it's kind of similar to streaming online. Let's say that this video is being streamed live on YouTube. There is a certain amount of bandwidth that my internet can provide in order to support the bit rate that's being sent over the internet right but if it's your local network it would kind of be the same thing and that can quickly overwhelm the network bandwidth that is available at, at your place so in this case i think this is a college or a university so the issue could be the network bandwidth but there's also an issue with the camera server that's processing the server, the encoding, that's also sending it just like as if you were to stream. Just like as if you were to stream data to YouTube or any other live streaming service. So what I would do, I would go to the camera server, because that's most likely what's going on. I would say I would... Yeah, let's see, I would check the settings on the camera server and make sure that the bit rate, I'm going to say data bit rate is not set to very high, I suppose this could cause issues with the network speeds if too much data is being sent the, the issue here is not just like the bit rate but it's also the encoding of it so sometimes if the server is not fast enough, it may not be able to handle multiple streams, multiple feeds of video because this data, the data packets, if they're too large and they're hard to process, they won't be able to handle it. And let me just check here. Cameras, you mentioned multiple cameras, so there's definitely more than one camera, which could be problematic. Let me just show you something real quick here. I'm going to say youtube for streaming here we go so this is what you need right so check this if it if the cameras that you're looking at are 1080p resolution then these are the bit rates that you want before it comes to a point where it starts to pixelate meaning lose quality where you can't even see what's going on so make sure it's not higher than this so you can try to aim for a middle which is what 4500 or something like that so make sure that this is set to that right but if it's lower than that then you can go to even less and as long as you adjust this it shouldn't cause any problems with the performance on the workstations right all of this should be separate from the workstation itself because all it's all that's happening is that you are viewing the cameras on the workstations right you're viewing and yes there is some processing done on your end as well but you're not doing the encoding you're not doing the heavy lifting when it comes to viewing just like on any computer you can pull up multiple videos on youtube and they'll be running fine right that's because you're just receiving data and you're viewing you're not necessarily uh, encoding and processing data at the same time and sending it over the internet meaning uploading you're not doing that you're just viewing and downloading uh, so for those reasons I would concentrate on the server itself that's handling this so I'm just gonna leave it at that all right let's look at from Raul 
intermittent shutdown and black box there is something that have irritated me for two years my pc keeps shutting down intermittently and displaying the box black box at the same time my pc is amd ryzen oh okay so it's uh, ryzen 3500 with radeon rx 5500 gpu update the gpu drivers but the issue still exists windows 11 I have another issue with YouTube videos. The YouTube videos keeps flickering pretty often through the movie seems fine. Though the movie seems fine. Huh. Let's see some of these screenshots. So this is the error. Uh, problem with your hardware caused Windows to stop working correctly. Doesn't say much else to me. This is just these are just reference numbers. Let's see this other one. Oh, so, okay, so it's definitely an issue with your GPU, unfortunately. You'd see how it's, it, the, this is what's happening, is that your video driver is crashing. I, I know you said you updated it, right? I know it, you said it upgraded, but it could be a couple of different things, right? It could be that your GPU is overheating and your video driver stops responding. Your video card just freezes up. It's definitely related to that and it, it just first here here's what you can do let me do this here well matter of fact let's look up what is it exactly AMD Radeon RX 5500 let's do this so here we go images so it could be any of these, but let's say, for example, you have dual fans, make sure they're both spinning. Now, they won't necessarily spin all the time. Some of these fans will only come on when they need to, and it's like controlled by the AMD Radeon uh, control panel or software, I forget exactly. But make sure that the fans do spin whenever you are watching something or playing a video game or something like that. Make sure that they are turned on, because otherwise, if they're not spinning, that means they're not cooling off. And with overheating, you can have these type of issues. So that's one thing. Now, I know you've updated your driver, which is great. And that's definitely what I would do, too. But make sure that you're, you're not overclocking, that your GPU is not overclocked. And that, might, that would definitely cause instability. If you don't have, uh, you know, if you don't have enough, if you don't have proper cooling and whatnot. Now, there's, when it comes to overclocking, you have to adjust the voltage sometimes too to make it stable, but that creates more heat. For example, if you want to overclock your GPU to be faster or CPU, you have to give it more voltage. And more electricity, more voltage creates more heat, obviously. It pulls more wattage from your power supply. I mean, you could assume that maybe the power supply is to blame, but I don't think so because this is a typical Windows, uh, the not Windows, but AMD GPU driver crash. And this is basically asking you to send the report to them just so they can possibly look at it. I mean, I don't know if this is possibly useful to whoever it goes to over there at AMD, but I would look at that and possibly underclock so you can go into overclocking settings and do it this of course i i can't tell you to do this for sure because every time you mess with this type of stuff you do it at your own risk but you can try underclocking it so you go to overclocking panel uh, which is, should be part of the driver and uh, lower lower the speed of it which could make it more stable so that's what I would try to do. Unfortunately, I wish I could help you more, but it's definitely something to do with your GPU. That's what I would do. I'm going to say, I think this issue is definitely related to your GPU either overheating. I'm just gonna say either overheating or some other hardware related issue. 
I would check to make sure the fans on the GPU are running and that your GPU is not overclocked possibly lower the GPU speeds to make it more stable I hope that helps I'm gonna pick this one here adding a computer to a domain how to add a computer to domain so in order to add a computer to a domain you need to right click the start button and go to the system so this is just one way to get to it but what you actually need to do is go to advanced system settings and this is going to be slightly different in Windows 11 which I will show you but this is how you do it in Windows 10 so go to the system properties and you just need to get to advanced system settings and you can also search for advanced system settings within just your start menu or I should say the taskbar you can just click on the search and uh, type in what you're looking for and you have to make sure that you select computer name as the first tab under the system properties select change where it says here to rename this computer or change its domain or work group select change and as long as you have connection to the domain you should be able to add it to a domain and of course you need administrator privileges specifically for that domain not the local admin account so not the local admin account but a domain admin account administrator account because you need those privileges in order to add a computer to a domain you can see this computer name is named stream and you can rename it at the same time so if you want to name it something else you here's your opportunity to do it at the same time and all you have to do here is just select domain type in a uh, name of the domain for example well let me see what I have running is my domain controller here here is my domain I'm going to go to Active Directory figure out what the name of the domain is so I'm going to go to Active Directory users and uh, accounts and the name of this domain is corp.contoso so I'm going to type that in corp.contoso.com and whatever yours is yours is going to be different right and then I'm going to select OK and then after this since this computer is not connected to it then I can show you how to do it on a domain controller uh, or, or domain connected computer uh, you will get a prop for administrator login right so you will get a login account then you type in your administrator login ID and password and this is the error you get if your computer is doesn't have access to that domain with Windows 11 it's done a similar way so if you right click the start button go to system you will get something that looks similar however you will get an option to select related links for example if you scroll down you can see you can select here domain or work group or advanced system settings but of course if you select the search box here you can type in advanced come on advanced there it is view advanced system settings which will take you to the same place that we saw in Windows 10 and here is the same place if you go to the computer name which is the first tab here select change you can see this computer is named computer one and you can see that it's already part of domain so if you want to add this this is where you would do it and of course you would use administrator admin login for that domain in order to join it to this domain just like you see here all right I'm gonna pull up my actor directory users and computers just to show you here and if I select let's see users you have to make sure you have a login that has administrator privileges when you're adding this so for example this one here this one here is called lab admin and it's built-in account for administering the computers on domain so I can use lab admin as a login ID to add this computer to that domain all right very good question minimize action and I'm going to say reply if you go to 
advanced system settings under first tab called or I should say named computer name on that on that tab select change to add computer to domain computer needs to be on the same network and you need domain admin login id and password complete thank you for submitting this ticket all right let's scroll down and look for something else we got tons of tickets here i don't know what to pick i'm just trying to pick not, i'm trying not to pick stuff that we've already talked about here's this one printer not the responding hello help desk or hi help desk my name is emily brown and i'm having trouble with my printer Whenever I try to print a document, the printer does not respond and print job remains in the queue, right? So it can't print at all. That's just, it gets stuck on the local queue on the computer. I have tried restarting both my computer and the printer, but the issue persists. Now you can have a queue that's also stuck on the print server, but let's talk about the fact that we don't know whether the printer itself is local printer or a network printer if it's a local printer that's plugged in with a usb directly to the computer obviously make sure that the computer or the printer itself i'm sorry is plugged in there's a connection that it's online that the drivers are installed so you can look at that by simply going to printers and devices printers and scanners i apologize look for it in here whatever it's supposed to be and it would say whether it's installed whether it's offline and it will look something similar to this if it's a network printer it would also show up in here but it would typically have a network name what is also known a host name but the host name is also applied to a computer name that's on a domain as well now not to confuse you here so I'm going to assume this is a network printer because if it's a business then chances are it's going to be a shared network printer USB printers are much easier to troubleshoot, but network printers are not so much because there are multi factors or multi layers when it comes to making sure that a network printer is working properly. All right, so let's look at this here. I'm going to open up our domain controller and I'm going to open up a command line. And if it's a network printer, you should be able to reach it as long as it's online. So you have to make sure that the connection exists, first of all, on the network if it's a network printer. Right, so how would you do that? Well, you just need to know the name of the printer or its IP address. So if you type in ping name of the printer, so whatever the name of the printer is, you type it in here, in like this. Not literally like this, but let's say the name of the printer is printer1. You would type in ping printer1 if that's what it's named for your business. And then you would get a response whether printer1 exists. And it says here ping request could not find host printer. Please check name and try again. So what is this telling us? Is that it's telling us that the printer1 doesn't exist on the network or also could tell us that the printer one is not set up correctly and it's not within dns what is dns the dns is a domain name system and dns handles the parts of where you don't have to remember the ip address of the printer you can just remember the name of the printer and use the name to install or add that printer on the user's computer so that way they can access it so what do i mean by that the printer can also be added using the ip address but instead of having to remember what the ip address is we can just remember that it's named printer one right in this case printer one is not set up it's not set up in dns it doesn't exist this is why we're getting this error it says ping request could not find host printer 
host you could say here host name and that's just another way of saying a computer name or a printer name otherwise if you had if you knew what the IP address is for this printer on the network you can type in whatever that IP address is for example this whatever the IP address is and you can also add a printer using the IP address as well but it's typically not done so if I ping that it's not going to work because it doesn't exist so the first step is we have to make sure that this printer is within DNS this printer name is being routed or forwarded correctly again you're using a printer name instead of having to remember the IP address so that way you can easily add these printers to users computers let's open up DNS here and see what we have here we know that we can look up our DNS record this is our called DNS records to make sure that it's being forwarded correctly but let's see how that looks like so it's forwarding of the IP address or forwarding of the name to the IP address for those reasons with DNS open we're going to select forward lookup zones so we're going to search those zones to see if there is a DNS record for that printer I'm going to expand this and I'm going to make sure that I select the correct domain because you will have multiple domains in here multiple domains that keep their own records and in this case our domain is corp.co.so and if you select that you can see it would populate whatever all of it that it's in there if this has a lot of stuff and chances are we'll have thousands and thousands of DNS entries we can filter it so right click your domain name go down to view select filter select name starts with and you can type in what did we use printer one and we're going to select OK after this you have to make sure you right click the folder where it says corp cointso or whatever your domain is so right click again select refresh and there are no result what you're getting here this is something that shows up just as part of the domain it's not a dns entry these are not dns entries for our host name specifically so there is nothing there now let's look for something that we know there is a dns entry for so i'm going to do the same thing right click go to view select filter and i'm going to type in client 2. so this time i'm going to type in client 2 which i already did sorry that there were sirens playing so i had to kind of cut that part out and type in client 2 and select ok and you have to select refresh again so right click the folder select refresh you can see there is entry for client 2 and you can see that its IP address is 10.0.0.111 so DNS entry for client 2 is working however for our printer it's not so this is one of those fictional issues where you have to make sure that this is the first step you check to see if the DNS record is there right so what's the next step well what else could it be well the print server itself so if I open up the print server by the way I have a great video on adding network printers I'm going to post a link to come up right now if you don't see it that means I forgot so please ask me in the comment to send you the link to the print adding a network printer and it gives you the step-by-step -step instructions where is the print server I wonder if I even have print server installed on this nope I don't have print server installed <laughs> all right well this is how you do it this is how you add a print server if you go to the server manager I'm gonna post a link uh, don't worry I'm not gonna let you hang so I'm gonna post a link on how to complete this printer setup for the network and how everything works but if you have a server installed and you need to add a role which is a print server <laughs> go to the server manager select a role no it's doing something it's collecting inventory come on hurry up there okay all right here we go <laughs> select add a role select the next and we're going to select role based and feature based installation next okay I'm gonna select whatever the default is here I apologize this turned into something else again I have the video on how to add this printer and how to create it so don't worry check that out 
All right, and then I'm going to select print and document services, select add features. Yeah, I'm not missing anything else. Nope, that's it. Select next, select next again, select next. And the print server. I'm going to install internet uh, internet printing as well so we can have a web access so that way we can do some troubleshooting like that next all this looks good next and then install so in the next video we will have it all right I apologize for that this is gonna take a while to install so I'm just gonna let it marinate if this is a network printer Please make sure it is configured correctly. Check DNS, DHCP, which I'm assuming that part of IP address. So he needs a reserved IP address. Please watch that uh, printer video. It's great. So he needs a DNS entry, he needs a DHCP reservation. So meaning IP reservation and the what else uh, and printer print server settings otherwise actually otherwise if there is an error on the printer itself for example out of toner and such this could place the printer in offline state so those errors like this out of toner and such can also make the printer appear offline which is offline because it takes it offline until you resolve the error right there is an error all right complete let's pick something else all right let's look at this one here microsoft F office application when attempting when attempting to open any word pdf or excel sheets i mean this should be separate from oh, okay office is not pdf is not part of office but anyways i'm getting the attached error and it says something went wrong we couldn't start your program please try starting again if you want to start, try repairing office programs and features, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, I mean, this could be a couple of different things, but the obvious one that we can do here is repair. So if I go to add, remove programs, look for office. Here is Microsoft Office 365. Select advanced options, scroll down, and select repair. And this is a quick repair. So this is a very fast repair that happens on your computer there are two different types of repairs for office or office 365 it's a little bit different for older offices but you will get an option to repair nonetheless whether it's on advanced options or manage i think the old one if you would look it up in a, in a, uh, in add remove programs it would say it would say manage instead of advanced options so if it's older office uh, office suite if you will now you can do a full repair if you go and download office 365 you can do a full repair here it is you just search for it and where is the link it's somewhere here install uh you have to log in with your account to download it if you're going to do it manually Anyways, so you can download it manually. You just have to log in, in when you go to office.com with your Microsoft uh, with your Microsoft account. You can also do it through SCCM, for example, the content manager. Let me see. Do I even have uh, or CCM, I should say, uh, software center? Uh, okay, I don't have it here. Anyways, I have a video on software center or sccm if you will 
Now it's called Endpoint, Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. And basically it's a way to manage software installation and updates on your computer. I have a video on that as well. And uh, I'll put a link to that as well. Sorry, I, I've already made stuff on this. So <laughs> it's kind of the same difference, but I highly suggest that you do, uh, do check it out. Say I would try repairing the office suite from add remove programs. You can also manually install slash repair by downloading the office program from office.com after you log in with MS after you log in because you could have a domain login and log into it office.com and still have that option because this is how cloud is set up nowadays so even if it's your login for your work for your job you can still log into office.com given that your work uses office 365 it will still let you log in with your regular login for your work resolved all right let's look at this one here it says the deleted folder appears empty again and again and i have a problem that the folder that i delete appears again after some time there is nothing in it i tried everything this check recycle bin repair check the rights everything is fine do you perhaps know what else it could be it is windows 10 22h2 all right let's see what this looks like so right away you can tell that this is a shared network drive and it's this is the network path here all right so it's this folder and there is a timestamp. well let me see when this ticket was submitted and this was submitted august 1st so quite recently we can see that in june so i know it's empty i don't know it's empty even after you're deleted but there is some kind of a cache thing going on on the network shared drive itself there could be a, a backup that's what it is probably i want to say it's actually a backup that is set up that keeps rechecking and re-adding a folder in here so i would this is something that whoever has access to the network share have to look at this so I, I hate to do this because i don't have a way to actually replicate this i'm just going to say i would check with desktop support team to see why this folder keeps coming back it could be related to a network backup running a process that we're running a process in the background with cached folder name it could also be that someone else is using the same shared folder location on the network and has it open or cached on their computer yeah check to see who else has access to it
Yeah, and just follow up with them, I suppose. It's an interesting ticket. Thank you for submitting it. All right, so let's talk about this ticket here where it says VDI access. And it says, one of our faculty is unable to use VDI. So what is VDI? VDI stands for Virtual Desktop Infrastructure. In the nutshell, VDI is a virtual desktop or a virtual computer. And here are some examples of that. I'm going to minimize this here and show you Hyper-V Manager. Hyper-V Manager can help you create a lot of different virtual desktops. In this case, we have a bunch of them here. So here is client one, client two, client three, four. And yes, of course, you can run servers. Here is a domain control server. Here is a content management server. All of these are virtual desktops. And how do you connect to those? Well, you can do it simply by using remote desktop or you can use alternatives like Citrix Workspace. And we're going to expand on all of these things. But let's go back to our ticket and kind of double check to what the issue is. It says he keeps getting an error message that he does not have access. So what are some things you have to do in order to make this happen? Of course, you have to have a virtual machine ready that is available for this user. And then you have to, of course, grant them access to it, which is something that desktop support would do. However, let's kind of talk about this because I really want you to understand how this actually works. So here is one instance running of a virtual desktop in the background. If I wanted to connect to it and I was giving access to it, chances are maybe they would just give me a name of a virtual desktop, meaning a computer name, also known as a workstation name or a host name, which is what you would really want to consider as a description for a computer or a name for a computer when it comes to the computing part of it. So let's just call it a host name, but it's the same thing as a computer name. So if I had access to this and I am a user somewhere, in this case, I think the user's name was Chuck. All I have to do is just need the name of the computer, which is here in this case, it's client one. I know it says here HYD, but it's actually client one in this case. So I would just open up my remote desktop. If this is the way to access this virtual desktop, I would just open up remote desktop connection, type in client one and select connect. So I'm just going to open it up by double clicking it here, just to show you that this virtual machine or virtual desktop is running. And here it is, it's coming up and I can just log in. I can select other user, it's Windows 11, and then I can just type in whatever my credentials are, type in my password, hit enter, and now I have a virtual desktop infrastructure or also known VDI or remote desktop or however you want to call it, then you have access to it. Now, sometimes the user, it says here, obviously other user and whatever that other user is, sometimes they need to have certain things done to the remote computer so they are allowed to connect to those machines. So we're going to kind of recreate and troubleshoot that as well. Now, let me just briefly touch on another way on how you can access these VDIs if it's set up like that within your business. Now, of course, there are other software that could provide this type of service but I believe Citrix is one of the most popular ones. So let's talk about how that looks like whenever you are a user or a person that wants to use these virtual desktops. Here is what virtual desktop looks like within Citrix. So you go to a website link, and this is just an example. I'm not actually logged in because I can't show you what it looks like at my work because it's a security issue, but this is exactly how it looks like. You would go to a web page, and this is just an example of where I went to just to see this image. You would go into the web page, you would log into it, and then you would see a bunch of different icons. All of these icons are similar to what VDIs are. Now, VDI usually refers to actual computer, a virtual computer. However, everything that you see on Citrix based platform, in this case, all of these, for example, Access 2019, Acrobat DC, Adobe After Effects, all of these things that you see, and it could be many, many different applications 
you can click on any of these and it would pull it up but it would actually be a virtual desktop that's handling the running of it so you would get a pop-up and for example here access 2019 would appear and it would look just like a regular application however that application is run on a virtual desktop so it will be the same difference is if I was to log into this virtual machine here that I showed you earlier I'm just going to log into it and it will be the same difference as if I was to log into this virtual desktop and open up Access 2019 except you wouldn't see borders you would see any of these bezels it would just look like a regular application that you've pulled up but it would actually be run on a remote server which in this case is Citrix now there is a desktop version of Citrix as well and you can run it a couple of different ways you can Citrix receiver on your computer to handle that part of it which is fine which is actually a probably a prerequisite in order to run this off of a website but you can also install desktop or I'm sorry Citrix workspace and if you look on the bottom here I have it installed I'm just going to click it to open up to show you how it looks like in the sense that this is a desktop software that would give you the same access so in here you have Citrix workspace open and you would type in my work email at my work.com right so you would basically just simply log in with your work email whatever that is and then once you once you log in it would look exactly like this here in the sense you would have home you have apps and then you can select any of those apps and run them so that's how you have different options of VDIs or virtual desktops, if you will. This is a really good opportunity to actually learn of these different types of virtual desktops that people use. So why do people use them? Well, you know, different reasons. Uh, the reason number one that I showed you, if it's just a regular virtual desktop, first one here, this is just a traditional full virtual desktop for virtual full virtual computer that the user can use and they can use it for whatever the business reason is for that whatever the work reason is for that and that's fine this is one way however the main difference here is that if you use citrix workspace and let me go back to our example if you use citrix you can control the access to all of these virtual machines which provide you with these virtual software so if somebody just needs access to adobe after effects 2020 you can simply grant them access to only that and once they log into citrix they would see adobe after effects 2020 and they can just click on that and that way you can control the access to different applications software tools like citrix that give you this type of capability are good when it comes to controlling access to specific applications and that's fine and how can you grant like so for example if you are working tier 2 or some kind of other tech support chances are you can also grant access for a specific person to these virtual software that is available through Citrix and how can you do that well you simply pull up AD for example actor directory you would look up the user in there and then you would add him to the group that has access to these specific to this specific software that's within citrix so i have the main controller here i'm going to log into it and show you how you can do that here we go admin tools actor directory so if it's set up like this this is how you would grant access to those individual software pieces or individual virtual machines that are within citrix so you can simply search for the user right click your domain find user and i think i have test user in here somewhere test user here we go test user let's pick this one here and then if it's created like this you can go to member off select add and then you would type in what do we talk about Adobe let's just pretend it's this whatever it is that you have access to that you can grant so you would for example say let's say it's called citrix dash 
Adobe 20, 2020. Select OK. Of course, it doesn't exist in here. But anyways, once you do that, it would appear for this user. You would select Apply. OK. And then that person, next time they log into Citrix, they will have access to Adobe. And that's how you would control that part of it. However, if, if we're going back to just, hey, I just want a virtual desktop. I just want a virtual desktop machine. You can also create those within Citrix as well. But if it's just a virtual desktop and you just want somebody to like basically give them access to virtual desktop, you can also do that by completely bypassing Citrix workspace. You can certainly do that. So once you have a client running like this one here, and I want to give a test user for that we just talked about that I just pulled up in the main controller, if I want to give them access to that, I simply have to do is open up client one and whether it's a domain administrator or a local administrator, you should be able to grant this. But I recommend you log in as a domain admin or you can simply manage it. And you can do this here through the domain controller as well. Same deal. Actor directory users. In this case, we're going to look up the workstation itself, which is called client one. So that way we can manage it. Did I spell that correctly? Well, let me see. Let me just browse to it. Hopefully it's still in there. Okay, client one is not in there. Anyways, client two is there. Let me make sure it's running properly. So client one is not joined the main. That's okay. We're going to kick it off client two to make sure it's running. Same difference. Okay, close. Uh, this is a script that's going to rejoin client one to our domain. So that way I don't have to do it manually because it's going to recreate this virtual lab or PC lab, computer lab, computer lab that is provided by Microsoft. If you need a link to that, let me know in the comments below, obviously. And let's select client two, manage, and we can do this on local level, manage. Come on, it's connecting. So we are vert we're going to remotely manage access to client two on this computer, which is doing it through Actor Directory. Here is our client two. And if you want to give remote desktop access to this person, so to test user four, we would expand local users and groups on that remote computer. You can see how our computer management is now connected to client two. So it's part of the domain and you can you can also do this by going to action connect to another computer if you have computer management open up on your computer. You don't have to be necessarily doing this from the domain controller. If you have domain access or admin access, I should say, you can run computer management on your just regular computer and then just go to connect to another computer. So and then type in client two. So if I do this here and just type in client client wow client two <laughs> client <laughs> client one okay and then click okay and it would basically be the same thing so we need to add this test user four to a local group that has the ability to use just a plain old remote desktop which again is this remote desktop connection so that way whenever they type in in this case client two they can connect to it and they would have the ability to log in as well so we're selecting groups in this case because we need to add test user for to test user four to the remote desktop users which is right here by adding test user four to this now test user four has the ability to, and matter of fact, let's just read what it says here for the description of this. Members of in these groups are granted the right to log in remotely. So this is the login part of it. This is just so they can remotely log into this computer. Now, sometimes you have to also add this part of it where it says remote management users depending how it's set up in your business, but it says here members of this group can access WMI resources over management protocol. 
So workstation management in Windows. Anyways, sometimes you have to do this as well. So add this one for the user. Again, we are granting test for test user for the ability to just use remote desktop and log into this. And then sometimes you would have to do it for the other ones. And I forget which one was a system managed account groups or something. One of these other ones, sometimes you will get an error, but generally speaking, if you want to allow somebody to use just a regular remote desktop on a remote computer, you have to make sure that they're added locally to remote desktop users or remote desktop or remote management users as well. If you get an error, carefully read it to what it says. And it would say, for example, this user is not part of this group. We'll go in here and look for that. I forget the, the other, the third most common error that comes up. I want to say it's this one, system managed account groups or something like that. One of these, but the, generally speaking, you just need remote desktop users and maybe this one here. And then that person can open up a remote desktop, type in client to select connect, and they would be able to connect, right? So I know it failed there because my this computer that I'm using here is not part of the same domain as or same same network that these uh, virtual desktops are running on. This was why this is why I was getting that error. It has nothing to do with access. Is what I was showing you earlier. All right, so that's that, and that actually turned out to be a quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of things to talk about. Now let's see what ChatGPT can tell us. And I'm going to tell ChatGPT AI to act as tech support. I'm going to say, please take a role of support. Please provide help desk troubleshooting steps for each trouble ticket presented. Let's see what happens there. So, and it says here, okay, it says here, I'll act as help desk troubleshoot. Okay, sure, whatever. Okay, stop generating. Okay, I'm gonna paste the ticket in there as it is just to see what it says here. So the answers it's providing me, the sensors that are that it's providing me are very extensive. Let me see what it does here. It says gather information, obtain the faculty member's name, contact information. That's fine. This is just part of help desk. You have to gather information first. And the first, the second thing here is check user permissions. Of course, this is what we've talked about as well as a first troubleshooting thing we can check on because it's kind of self-explanatory. It says he keeps getting an error message that it does not have access. So, you know, of course, account settings, ensure that faculty's member account is not locked or disabled. Sometimes repeat login attempts can lead to account lockouts. That's actually pretty good point but it wouldn't say necessarily that doesn't have access it would just say it's locked or i mean depends but it should say it's locked but yeah that's definitely a good thing to check we're still talking about access so we're still on the right track and here it says network connectivity confirmed that faculty member has stable internet connection yes that's fine and all these other stuff here vdi service status credentials verification this should be uh, number three or three here instead of account status necessarily and then account status as network as, as a step four password recess group membership so this should be up there higher to group memberships access policies so this is we just talked about all of this but this other stuff for example network connectivity that necessarily wouldn't be the case because it specifically says to us that it's access uh, access issue. There's no access as in, in the sense you can't log in. Now, if it was access as in I can't reach this remote server because it's down, then it would be different. 
but in this case the assumption is that there's no login access all right so these are all good these are all good steps and the last one here if the issue remains unresolved after troubleshooting escalate to take it to a higher level of support or the IT department responsible for VDI management so this is, these are really good answers and yeah I'm actually pretty happy with the result that ChatGPT gave us so that's cool uh, we're going to move on and let me I'm, I'm trying to I'm thinking I'm thinking right now whether I should keep going with this because if I keep going I feel like too much information will make it confusing and if I switch to another topic because this one was so lengthy that it also might confuse and might be a forgetful thing while these things are very important especially in today's age when everything's becoming virtual and cloud-based yes you can have all of these VDIs running on a cloud which you know what is a cloud I mean you can consider that anything that's whether it's on the internet or whether it's just set up as part of the network right depends how you look at it to me typically cloud means just something that's beyond your local network if you're talking about office products like if you are using office as part of your work so you can go to office.com and then to me that's beyond your local network to me that's cloud however you know if somebody starts talking about cloud and they talk about virtual machines like these that are running here this can also be considered a cloud it, it's kind of a broad description of things that you say to people who don't necessarily understand what you know computers or technology so you just say it's on the cloud it's somewhere on the cloud okay whatever it's somewhere on the network somewhere on the network running as a virtual <laughs> machine yeah I think I will leave it at that and make it just a window of its own of its own because I feel like it's very important if you need access to this virtual virtual lab set up from Microsoft it's available you can just Google it and look for Microsoft uh, PC lab or computer lab I think it's Microsoft's computer lab you can look for it and if it's really hard to find let me know and I'll give you the link also if you need the link to this chat GPT and I've done this before I have different versions of chat GPT if you need a link to this specifically where you're seeing here I can send you the link to this as well you see I have a way to share chat and it will give you exactly what I've typed in here to get these type of results like for example here please take a you know a role of tech support and you can get different results depending on how you tweak AI and if you want me to talk about AI and more utilization when it comes to tech support and making a specific tool that gives you the best results uh, yeah I can talk about that I can make a specific video for this matter of fact I have a more a fairly recent video talking about AI and how you can use it as a tool you know for tech support but yeah it can be tweaked even more and I have results of that look for that video there it's it's on my channel I want to say it's like you know a couple of months ago maybe and uh, there's a link to that as well so you can check that out and you can tweak it so that it works for you in your work environment but of course if you decide to use chat GPT or any AI to as a tool while you're doing tech support make sure you run it by your bosses make sure it's allowed to use within your work environment because of security issues what I've pasted in here as a ticket you know you don't want to release any personal information here notice how I didn't copy the person's name or anything like that because I just you just never know but generally speaking all the videos that I make do not release any personal information unless it's otherwise public you know this is why I have a statement in front of my video that um, no personal information is being leaked or anything like that unless that person doesn't care in this case it's 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 you know or, or if it's just public information you know if it's just public information and uh, I'm just gonna close the ticket say please reach out to 
I'm just going to say desktop support team. You can grant if if you are able to grant access to VDIs, then the solution would be that. But if you don't, please reach out to desktop support desktop support team or whoever has the ability to grant access. Result. All right, let's try this one here. Trouble with Google Chrome. For about a week now, I cannot access faculty load and compensation through Google Chrome, which I'm assuming is a website. When I log into Simon, it looks all jumbled. All right, and when I click on the faculty load and compensation, which I'm assuming is a link, it says you are not authorized to view this page. All right. I thought it may correct itself because others are having the same difficulty, but as of today, it's still like this. I can get into... I can get in with no problem going through Microsoft Edge, but I'd like to get into it through Chrome too. So this usually happens when there are issues with a website and you are basically using old links for that website. So what's happening is that if you are getting this message say still, here it says you are not authorized to view this page, chances are you are trying to access a page that has been cached with your previous instance or your previous session for that link. So this is usually happening with websites where you have to log into. The reason for that is that every time you log into a website with your login ID and password, it creates a session ID for you specifically. So if you are still trying to access that same page, and some changes have happened on the website itself, chances are it's gonna give you this type of error because you are trying to access an old and expired session for that website specifically for you. The reason it's specifically for you is because you logged in as you and created that encrypted session for yourself specifically, but it's no longer there. And this is why you may get this error where it says you are not authorized to view this page. So the URLs may have changed as well. Anyways, I just want you to keep that in mind as the reason to why this is happening. Now let's go and talk about on how to fix this. As you notice here, it says I can get in with no problem going through Microsoft Edge. So why is that? It's because if you haven't used Microsoft Edge as your main browser, right? If you haven't used your Microsoft Edge as your main browser, your main browser in this case is Chrome. Of course, Microsoft Edge is not going to have any cached version of that website that you're trying to use. So the first time you use the website, you're going to get the new version of it. You're going to get a new cached version of it, cookies, autofill of your passwords and this and that. So basically all the data that you're getting from that website is going to be fresh on Microsoft Edge, probably because you don't normally use Microsoft Edge. And this is why it's working on Microsoft Edge, but still not working on Chrome. Okay, so let's go ahead and fix this. The way you fix this, and as you've guessed it probably by now, is by deleting old data for that website that's associated with that website. All right, so I'm just going to here go to settings. So on the right hand side of Chrome, there are three dots. Go down, select settings. And you can browse through this for the settings where, you know, the cookies and site data are and delete them, you know, just by doing so. But you can also search. Since nowadays there are so many settings within here, I also always say if you don't know or if you don't have time to look for something, just just search for it. You do have a search box for a reason here within the settings themselves because there are so many different settings. So if you want to search for cookies, it is the fastest way. And if this is the fastest way to you find it, then you can certainly do so. 
And here are the results that we get by just simply searching for cookies. Or, you know, you can see it says here, clear history, cookies, cache, and more. And sure enough, it would be within here. So this is one way to try to, you know, basically delete what you have accessed recently. And it tells you what it is, right? Here is selected on advanced, but normally it's under basic, where it says here basic, and then it would it tells you what it would clear. It would clear browsing history, cookies in other sites, cached images and files. But this doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good idea for you to do because you have cached data for other websites and that cached data might be very useful to you or the user or the customer. So the reason you don't necessarily want to do this is because you don't want to delete their search data that they rely on as part of their job. So you want to specifically target that one website instead of trying to delete all cookies for every website that they've accessed. And this is what this would do. Even if you go to advanced, the only option is that you can delete more things from it that they've cached over time, but you can do that if you want. And if they're okay with it, that's fine. However, I like to target the website itself specifically. Okay, so let's do that. And the way you can do this is by selecting third party cookies here, select that. Scroll down and select see all site data and permissions. Select that. And now you have data specific to each website that you normally visit. So in this case, I obviously don't have the link to the website that the person was using, but you have the option here to look for it. And you can also search for it right here. So whatever the website name is, if there are thousands in here, you can type in and search for it say my website, this and that. Whatever the name is, you can search through it and find it specifically. In this case, let's pretend it's, I don't know, let's pretend it's Yahoo here, right? You can see that if you click on Yahoo, you can see all the 12 cookies that are there. And for those reasons, you can simply select delete here where it says remove yahoo.com. So this would specifically delete site data and permissions for Yahoo and all sites under it. That means like other URLs that they're using. In this case, right here, you can see these are all things that came from Yahoo. So these are all probably just links that are associated with Yahoo last time you went to it. So I'm just going to remove all of that and we're gonna pretend that that's the website that is causing the problem. Now, all you have to do is just go back to that website and the issue should be resolved. That's the main reason for this to happen. All right, so let me just type this out as a reply. In your Chrome browser, please delete cookies and site data specific to the web site you are trying to access. This, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that. But let me just type in again what the reason is. The reason why you may not be able to access this web site through Chrome is most likely related to old cached data. Dot, dot, sure. Cached, would you say cached or cached? Uh, I always say cached, I don't know, it doesn't matter, cached. Although I did say cached earlier, didn't I? Anyway, that, <laughs> this is how you would do it. So. This should resolve the problem. Okay, I'm gonna resolve this ticket and move on. All right, so this one is a calendar issue. I updated Microsoft 365 yesterday and now a calendar that is shared with me is blank. So let me tell you right now, every time you update a Microsoft 365 product and let's say you have lost your local inbox, which is supposed to be offline, which is called the OST file. And if it hasn't been created or let's say it's been deleted for some reason. In this case, 
it could happen if you update or reinstall Microsoft 365 app on your computer. The first time you log into Outlook, it has to resync everything that is stored on the cloud, meaning that it has to re-download your inbox, which is your .ost file, and it has to also sync your calendar items. So let's say you have a lot of calendar items. I've seen this issue where you just have to simply give it time to sync everything that is there. I still see the calendar in my list, but none of the appointments are showing. Yeah, that's just typical. All the appointments, especially if it's a shared calendar. So let's say you are an admin assistant of some sort and you are basically creating calendar items on behalf of somebody or simply there is a shared calendar that you do work with, then yeah, it will take time for it to sync up because it's not necessarily just you that has all this information, but the other people that are also sharing. And this stuff just takes time to sync up. All right, let me just let me just open up Outlook here to show you kind of. I don't have a syncing issue on my calendar, but just to show you that this could happen. So in this case, you can see that this person has two inboxes and they're logging as two different people. It's not necessarily unusual if you are like an admin assistant, you may have this ability. But in this case, let's look at Adele, let's select Adele's inbox here. And there are stuff in here, but there are very few things. And usually if there is a syncing issue, on the bottom here somewhere, I want to say like right about here, it will tell you that it's still syncing, that it's either in downloading your inbox, and your calendar items. So it's gonna take a while for it to sync. So let's go to calendar right away. Here is the calendar. You can see that Adele has a couple of different calendars in here. Let's kind of stretch this out just so we can see. And she can see other shared calendars which are right down here. And one of the issues could be, yeah, I can see it, but I don't see it on the right hand side over here. Well, maybe the issue is let me just change it to weeks here so it's more apparent you can see there are other calendars that you can see which are shared but if you haven't necessarily selected them they may not even show up so just make sure that that's not the issue make sure that it's the check mark is there so that way you can see all these other ones you see how it's populating you can see how it's populating we can you just make sure that this is checked just because you see it doesn't mean that you're reviewing it and for those reasons make sure it's checked otherwise it's just simply a you know sinking issue it may take a while for it to show up let me uncheck all of this type of stuff here i'm going to uncheck all of these other teams groups so right now i'm just viewing my own calendar it says my calendar here my calendar and you can see it's just for bob but if i select this one here where it's for shared calendar this is for adele select that you see how it just pops in right away and you can change the view right here or how you want it to show and it's the same difference just make sure it's checked here or it's a syncing issue where you just have to wait for it to sync all right let's go to the web version of that real quick here is the outlook and in this case i am only signed in as adele let me just update my password here real quick. I'm only signing here as Adele, so we're only going to see what she sees and not Bob. Here is the two-factor authentication that I'm getting. The ping you heard is from my two-factor authenticator on my phone, and I'm just going to use that code. Again, these are fictional people. Don't worry, I'm not worried about personal information being released here because this is only this is for training purposes only. All right, so this is the online version of that. So this is Adele only. We're not going to see anything from Bob. Select calendar over here, and here it is. Same difference. She won't see any other shared calendars unless they're checked. In this case, you can see that this one is checked, which is fine. So only here, seeing only hers, but in order to see the other one, or group ones, you have to select the group calendar. You have to select the, this one here, which is deployment team. Right now, you really don't see much, but if I selected the split, I can see the deployment team's calendar and my own on the right side. I can change it to month, and now I can see a little bit more of what is shared, which is more apparent. So if I uncheck this shared one, you can see it disappears, right? But if I check it again, you can see that it comes back up.
Again, just make sure it's not a syncing issue. This is a web version. This is why it works instantly because it's web version. It's already on the cloud. The web is on the cloud, right? This is why it works like that. Okay, minimize action. And let's go back to our ticket. For this reply, I'm going to say it may take a bit of time time for calendar to sync I didn't spell that right okay the sync with outlook app that is installed on the computer because it needs to download a local copy of the inbox and the calendar. Let's see, otherwise, make sure when viewing your calendar that it is selected with a check mark. Sure, let's leave it at that. Okay. All right. That is that. And of course, if, if you are, you know, doing this for somebody, you just have to take control of their computer and just do it. Uh, let's try this one here. No sound. Good afternoon. I went to listen to Dr. K's talk today and I do not have sound, but do for other things on the internet so i'm assuming it's a web meeting of some sort okay let's open up teams this is teams app that is installed on the computer it's different for the web version so teams app and uh, if you want to check your audio settings select the three dots right next to your login uh, login initials or login uh, profile select three dots select settings select devices and make sure that your headset or whatever it is that you're using is selected in here. In this case, we have a Plantronics headset that is connected. Make sure that speakers and microphone are selected as such. So that way you know it's you know set up correctly. That means it's connected properly. Otherwise, if it's still not working, then your headset is bad. Now it's different on the online version. It's quite different actually. So let's go back to online online version of teams and uh, once it loads if you noticed if i click on the three dots up here and go to settings oh, sorry i have to sign in again i just signed in you saw me <laughs> uh, every time you change password it has to it, it does this come on i don't feel like setting this up so in a business environment you wouldn't necessarily oh it's confused you wouldn't necessarily have this issue because it would be set up with uh, one sign, which basically, in a, as long as you're connected to the network itself, it won't bug you with this. Oh, look at that. I broke it because I have calendar open with the new password. Okay, all right. Let's try it again. So the reason I had I, that this is happening is because what I had open was Outlook with the new password open already. So it's holding on to that session. Now I've closed Outlook and now it's just, it should let me, well, here we go. I broke it. That's okay. See how it says here, session ID. And remember, remember we, uh, we had this issue with the first ticket where you get this error, right? And this is because it's holding on to the session ID, which is the cached, cached version of that. Okay. So we can fix it. it. It could just be fixed by closing Chrome here and opening it up but it, we might have to go in and delete that cached version. So let's go to office.com. I'm glad that actually happened. Okay, let me log in, even though I'm pretty sure, did I change the password on the web version? I may have updated it or not. Anyways, again, it's that session ID that I was telling you about. Let's go to Teams. Let's see if that fixed it. Try again. Come on sign in okay Le okay perfect perfect i'm glad this happened all right let's go back to let me just make sure i close this website here 
so that way it's not holding on to that session so right now let me open up a new tab okay making sure that the website is still not open right make sure that that website is closed completely settings all right this in this case i'm just going to manually look for it instead of searching for it so it's privacy and security all right clear browsing data this is where you could do that thing that we showed you earlier here's third party cookies scroll down see all site data and permissions here is office.com and here's microsoft.com let's go ahead and delete actually here's microsoftonline.com so any of these could be used for that well actually it's this one office.com outlook office.com so if you want a bit more specific here's teams one microsoft online i'm going to leave this microsoft online for now but let's go ahead and delete these first two because first one is teams and the other one is outlook so let's go ahead and delete these deletage i'm going to leave this one here okay let's try this again office.com it's funny how that happened i'm glad it happened so that way we can see what is happening so i have to re-authenticate so we are re-authenticating and creating our new session which will generate our new session id I'm using a two-factor confirmation on my phone with the authenticator microsoft authenticator i typed in that code all right skip okay we're logged in now to this let's see if teams works now Okay, come on, come on. And there it is. Come on, just one more step. I'm not going to put in a phone number for every fictional person that I'm working with. <laughs> All right. Almost there. Well, it keeps asking for that. It really wants me to put in my phone number in there. Come on, there it is. So we've fixed it. And that's a perfect example of how it can break and how it holds on to those broken sessions. Okay, I'm going to turn on notifications, allow notifications for this. Uh, create team schedule. I don't have time for this. So here we are in teams again. So let's select three dots here, select settings. And remember in the app version that is installed on your computer, it's completely different. Let me go back to this settings here. You can see that we do have devices on the locally installed teams. We have devices option, but on the web version, on the web version, we do not, we do not have an option to change these settings for the devices there. It's not there. So how do you go about fixing it? Well, the easiest way to actually go about it is whenever you go to teams and you know, I mean, there are other three dots here, right? What is that? Well, that this doesn't help us help us at all. It's not related. But if you start a session right here where it says, you know, start a new meeting, it's going to ask you, do you want to use your microphone? Fine, that's select allow. And here it is. This is where you would actually change your settings and make sure that your Plantronics, in this case, is set up correctly. And then you can select open devices. And it's just a, a thing that comes up on the side. So it's like a sort of like a, a column that pops up on the side. And it tells you that, oh, yeah, indeed, it's selecting the correct headphones so this is great if it's something else then make sure that you select whatever the user or wherever the customer wants so this is good if i join now it's going to work fine as long as the headset is not broken itself all right so that worked out perfectly now let's go back to our ticket and reply when you and and let me just let me just kind of point this out real quick it says here i do not have the sound but for other things on the internet okay it says i went to listen dr dr k's talk today and i do not have sound but do but i do for other things on the internet so in this case we know that it's very specific to the meeting or whatever is that the app that they're using to listen to Dr. K, right? So it's that app specifically. It's not a sound issue on like locally. There's no need for us to go 
Well, you can, but there's really no need, no need for us to go to the sound settings on the computer itself because the sound works for other things, okay? So it's specific to the app that is used to listen to Dr. K. Okay. Make sure to check the sound settings specifically for the... I'm going to assume, I'm, I'm going to say the app used to listen to Dr. K's talk. I.E. Teams or Zoom and etc. Whatever it is that you're using to listen to this meeting and by the way in zoom will be very similar you basically are looking for the same stuff whether it's zoom or or i don't know google meets or whatever i don't know whatever people use nowadays as well just make sure you look for sound settings in the app that is used in this in, in that specific situation all right ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoyed watching this video i have really enjoyed making it as well and if you're watched all the way through Please let me know. I actually have noticed that uh, some people say, yeah, I watched the whole video, which is awesome. It really makes a difference. It really makes the, uh, the channel more known to other people because YouTube starts recommending to other people that need this type of training. So I really appreciate you watching the entire video. I hope you have a wonderful day. And if I don't see you before then, I'm, I'm going to try to make another video before the holidays. But yeah. If you celebrate any of the holidays, I wish you and your family happy holidays. All right, take care. Bye-bye.